Hello, welcome to uh, this Social Work History Network event organised uh, with colleagues at, at BASWA. My name is Carl Purcell, I'm the chair for today's session. I'm a researcher at the Health and Social Care Workforce Research Unit, which is part of the Policy Institute at King's College London. I'm also a member of the Social Work History Network group. Um, appreciate that this may be the first time that many of you have attended one of our events. Um, but this has been one of the advantages of moving to online is that we've managed to, to, to get more people interested and hopefully we'll come to future events. Um, just a bit of background information, the Social, Hi Social Work History Network is a, an informal network of social workers, academics, historians, archivists that is now, I believe, 21 years old. Um, and we, we have these sorts of events periodically where we look back at uh, various uh, areas of social work policy, uh, past reviews such as that, like we are doing today. Uh, and we thought it was, this was a good time to, to look at child and family social work policy, given the ongoing independent review of social care uh, being led by Josh, Josh McAllister. I think it's fair to say that these once in a generation reviews do come along quite frequently over the decades, despite what everybody always says. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, Today you're going to hear from uh, three very prominent speakers. I'm delighted to, to, to welcome them all today. Um, first, you're going to hear from, from Tim Lawton, MP. Tim was the Conservative Party shadow children's minister from 2001 to 2010, I believe. And he then went on to serve as the children's minister uh, in the Department for Education between 2010 and 2012. Uh, Tim remains actively involved in this area policy and is the co-chair of the all parliamentary uh, all party parliamentary group children uh, he's going to talk about the, the conservative party's commission on social work which was set up in 2006 and which um, formed the basis for the work that he took forward uh, in opposition and then in government in subsequent years we'll then hear from um, andrew webb uh, Andrew was one of the deputy chairs of the Social Work Task Force that was set up under the Labour government in late 2008 after the Peter Connolly serious case review. Um, Andrew's a, a long career in this field. Uh, I think he qualified as a social worker in 1976 and worked his entire career in local authorities before retiring in 2018. Andrew was a director of children and adult services at Stockport when he retired. He also served as the ADCS, Association of Directors of Children's Services President between 2012 and 2013. And he continues to be involved in, in policy making in this area and is a, a board member of the, the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. And finally, our, our third speaker is uh, Professor Eileen Munro. Eileen has um, published extensive research on child protection and child welfare and will of course be best known to most for her landmark, landmark review of the English child protection system which interestingly was commissioned by, by Tim um, in 2010 and put, which reported in 2011 so 10 years ago. Um, but can I please encourage everybody to post your comments, your questions on the chat facility throughout the presentations. Um, we won't be able to put all of your questions to the speakers at the end, but myself and colleagues at Basra in the background will be keeping an eye on the chat to pick out common themes coming up, which hopefully we can uh, try and cover in the discussion at the end. Um, just before I hand over to Tim, can I have the next slide, please. I just wanted to remind colleagues uh, about context, the policy context at the, of the kind of mid 2000s when um, when Tim Tim's commission was set up. Uh, and in, in fact, some of you may be too young to even remember this period. So I think it's important to, to realise that this was a very difficult time for child and family social workers. We'd had the Victoria Columbia inquiry, which had run for 18 months and which reported in 
uh, January 2003, which highlighted widespread concerns, which were not only limited to Haringey, where <coughs> Victoria had sadly died, but highlighted problems about with interagency safeguarding child protection work nationally. Um, it's important to remember that it wasn't just social workers and social services departments that were criticised. There were lots of statutory and voluntary agencies which um, were, were deemed to have, to have, to have uh, failed in, in, the, in, in the Victoria Columbia case. But as, it, as is so often, the media reporting did pick up on the, on the uh, apparent failings of social workers. Um, it was in this within this context that. We had the, the Every Child Matters Green Paper, which was published later in 2003, which was framed as, as the government's response to the Victoria Columbia inquiry, although the, the origins of this paper are go back further, I think. But, um, and then that uh, was rolled over into the Children Act 2004, about a year later, and the Change for Children programme, which was the government's implementation plan for the Children Act, effectively. Um, this, as, this was a very destabilising period. I mean, there were lots of positive aspects of Every Child Matters, it's fair to say, but it was a very destabilising period for children and family social workers, I think. Um, the, main, the main change, which I'm, most people will recall, was, it was the creation of children's services departments, but this involved the breakup of social services departments, which had been created in 1970. And uh, the emerger of children's social care services with education services, but in most areas um, it was education professionals who were who were leading the new departments um, rather than social work professionals. I, I think this has changed more recently. Anyway, I, I think this is a good time for me to hand over to Tim because I'm sure we have more to say about the the morale and the status of the profession at, at this point. Thank you, Tim. Carl, thank you very much and thank you to the Social Work History Network for inviting me to this uh, event. I have to say, Carl, after your comment about many people on this call may be too young to remember some of the things you referred to already, this feels more like the Social Work Ancient History uh, Network with uh, some of the things we're going to be looking at uh, today. Um, and let me uh, come clean right from the start. I recognise I'm very much the amateur on this uh, panel. I'm the warm-up act for the luminary professionals such as Eileen and, uh, uh, and Andrew who uh, will produce the real um, meat. So I'm playing a bit part in, uh, uh, in this but I'm honoured to be invited to be uh, to be part of, uh, of this. It almost feels a bit like a, a, the reunion programme on Radio 4 getting together sort of 20 years on from the start of all this legislation which led up to the various reports uh, that we're going to be studying um, today. Um, it is almost uh, now nine years since uh, David Cameron decided to dispense with my services, having spoken for the Conservative Party on children's issues since, as Carl said, 2001, and then been the children's minister in the coalition um, government. And effectively, I was the shadow children's minister before there was actually a children's minister when Margaret Hodge was first appointed as the first children's minister formally back in 2003. Um, I think our approach to um, this afternoon is very much a conversational uh, one, so I'm not going to be giving a, a big lecture, and I will apologise first of all for the very amateur nature of my uh, slides, which were rushed together by a series of photocopies, which are then scanned. I was so intimidated by the very professional and detailed looking slides that Andrew produced that I thought I'd better produce something at least, but they are just as an aid and memoir for me, um, largely. So in, in preparing for this um, talk today, I revisited and I'm rather sad, I keep all my old speeches going back for the last 20 uh, years. And I was looking at some of the speeches I made when I was first Shadow Children's Minister back around 2001. And the problems that we were talking about then are depressingly familiar with the problems being talked about now. And some of the phrases used back in 2001, 20 years on, I see are being used in Josh McAllister's uh, report uh, just, uh, just produced. Phrases such as pushy, uh, parents and things like uh, that. So there is a real sense of deja vu, I'm afraid, with uh, that report we've just had from Josh McAllister. Um, so let's have the uh, the first slide, please, in the famous words of Professor um, Witte. Um, now, I have plagiarised shamelessly from uh, Carr's excellent uh, book, which I'm sure you're all aware of. If you're uh, not, I'm sure it's still available in all good 
bookshops, a really well-informed book, I have to say, for what's happened in children's services over the last uh, 20, uh, 20 years. And in the appendices to, the, to that book is a f fantastic list of various reports and legislation that have happened over that 20-year uh, period. I'm just looking through this list here, Department for Health, Modernizing Social Services, uh, Building a Strategy for Children and Young uh, People, uh, Tackling Child Poverty, The Laming Report on Victoria Climby, The Every Child Matters Report, The Youth Matters uh, Report, uh, Children's Plan, so on and so forth. We go on to the next uh, slide, it goes into uh, reports produced under the Conservative government as, uh, as well. And if we go on to the next slide, then let's look at the legislation. Um, the Children Act, obviously, which kicked off modern children's uh, uh, social services back in 1989. But in my time in Parliament since 1997, the Care Standards Act, the Children Leaving Care Act, the Adoption and Children Act, Children Act, Education Inspections Act, Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act, Children and Young Persons Act, Equality Act, under the last Labour government. And I was leading uh, for the opposition on most of those. There was a plethora of primary pieces of legislation going through Parliament. If we go on to the next slide, of course, there was even more regulations uh, going through as well. Regulations on care leavers, on children's homes, on care planning, on children in long-term residential homes. Then on the next slide, uh, loads of statutory guidance about designated teachers for looked after children, independent reviewing officers, uh, securing uh, sufficient accommodation for children in care, education of looked after children, runaway and missing children, uh, and so on. And then there was additional guidance on the next um, uh, slide for child sexual exploitation, tackling child CSE action plan, which I produced in 2011, and so on. And if we go on to the next slide, lots more stuff to do with adoption and uh, fostering. So we weren't short of legislation, guidance, regulations, and thousands of, in those days, sheets of paperwork being produced by the Department for Education and the Department for uh, Health. So one of the principles that informed me in my early days as Shadow Johns Minister, and I want to set out eight uh, principles which really informed how we got to uh, No More Blame Game in 2007 and how that then led into reports and legislation, and I'll give the introduction then to, uh, to Eileen coming in uh, later. I think the first principle was very much um, that it was all about quantity rather than quality. Social workers were being drowned in legislation, in guidance, in change of guidance, and in the rule book. And so, as Eileen quite rightly, I think, came to the conclusion um, social workers were spending so much of their time checking what the rules were rather than actually doing their job and using their professional uh, now and actually eyeballing those vulnerable children and families that their job was to uh, was to look after. So the first principle was uh, there was too much uh, of the, the rule book and too much legislation. It was getting in the way of social workers doing their uh, job and being um, professionals. And I think one of the unions at the time calculated that social workers were on average spending some 80% of their time in front of a computer rather than in front of uh, families. Then if you go on to the next uh, slide, and there was a bit of a uh, an interesting um, national watershed uh, moment. So just, I think it was uh, four and a half weeks after being made the Shadow Minister for Children's Social Care, uh, I went to the what was then the National Social Services Conference when children and uh, adults were still uh, combined in Harrogate uh, back in 2001. It's quite an intimidating gig for, for me. I mean, I had very little experience of children's matters. I'd uh, uh, just been appointed in this role. There were a thousand experts and practitioners in a hall in front of me. I, I found the speech, and I spoke in that speech about, uh, I quote, more depressing for you must be the constant bad press given to social workers and the apparent failures of social services departments. We hear nothing of the success stories of children successfully uh, sheltered from abuse or rescued from abduction, but then no one ever wants to read about the plane that landed uh, safely. And in those days, we had a real growing problem of high vacancy uh, rates and growing numbers of children coming into, uh, into care. The following day, Alan Milburn, who was then the health secretary responsible for children's social care, came and gave a rather notorious finger-wagging uh, speech 
where he was basically saying to all the social workers there, you need to buck up and get your act um, together. And the press on that was quite interesting. Here's a clip from the Community Care uh, magazine. The expectation was uh, that Health Secretary Alan Milburn would deliver a morale-raising uh, speech. Um, but he stunned the assembled social services directors and councillors by giving a swinging critique of failing councils. And Felicity Collier, the chief executive of BAF, who I'll come on to um, uh, shortly, I think summed it up really well. I was at the Harrogate conference full of anticipation, but Alan Milburn's speech left me feeling quite empty and depressed. I'd really believed he'd use his platform to launch a recruitment campaign with passion and a rallying call to all our social workers on the front line. Uh, but in the end, he, it was a further attack and demoralizing the most struggling local authorities when their directors and councillors were packed together. Do ministers never learn that there are other ways to improve performance? So the second principle that I learned in those days is social workers were really pilloried in the media. And it didn't help when you had politicians who were effectively supporting that uh, pillaring. And social workers, in contrast to the other emergency services, and many of us have referred to social work as the fourth emergency uh, services, uh, were really having a tough time. That was not gonna help um, uh, recruitment. And if you really want to boost the morale of a profession, you don't go and call them out and effectively boo them uh, in public as happened back um, then. In the next uh, social services conference, which I attended in 2002, uh, I refer back to that speech by um, Alan Milburn as wag wagging his finger at, uh, at the audience. And I asked then for the government to get off the backs of social services departments and social workers. If you think they are doing a good job, then let them get on with that job rather than constantly wrapping them up in Whitehall's newest structural changes, target tables and the latest short term financial novelty campaign. So the third principle, which I developed at this uh, stage, was trust the professionals and let them get on with their job. Social work is not a science. It's a real detective job in trying to work out what is really behind suspected abuse of a, of a child in a vulnerable um, family. Um, and the fourth principle was that we needed also to raise the educational standards and thereby the standing of social workers. There were too many stories then of social work graduates or, or uh, social work students being able to get onto a social work course with two grade E A-levels. That was all helping to undermine the uh, the standing of the whole profession. So that's really my start. And I spent the next three or so years scrutinizing all the legislation which the government was putting through, of which I've listed uh, uh, all of it, responding to the Victoria Climbier uh, inquiry, which obviously dominated many of the uh, headlines in this area, spoke at countless conferences, got out on the front line, spent a lot of time with social workers, with children and vulnerable families, kids in, in care, with academics, clinicians, and others. I spent a lot of time with the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, in particular, where the cabinet member was the late Shireen Ritchie, who had a real understanding uh, of some of the problems facing social workers. And one of the interesting things about Kensington and Chelsea is they rejected the government's integrated children's system, which was the computer model, which the central government was trying to impose on all children's services uh, departments. And it was hugely bureaucratic. And Kensington and Chelsea said, no, we don't, we don't want to have that. And they, um, they refused to take the money from government to develop it. And in the end, they got together their own social workers with their own computer programmers and designed their own recording system which worked for their social workers, much less bureaucratic, much more what social workers uh, needed. So the fifth principle which we adopted was that when you are designing systems, for goodness sake, include and involve the practitioners who are at the front line, who are going to be practicing this stuff day in, day out. And wherever you can bring in children who are your customers effectively, those children in the care uh, system in designing those uh, processes. But also I learned that it's not about processes. It should be about the quality of outcomes for those vulnerable children. And as Eileen later put it so succinctly, instead of doing things right, do the right thing. And we had all become completely obsessed with just following the, uh, the rule book. 
So by 2006, we needed to firm this up in a policy and present a conservative vision for child protection and the professionals who worked uh, within it. Back in 2006, in Duncan Smith had set up the Centre for Social um, Justice, uh, producing a lot of stuff about family um, breakdown, but not dealing necessarily with, uh, with social workers and child um, protection. So challenged by Elizabeth Butler-Sloss, Baroness Butler-Sloss, who'd been president of the Family Court uh, Division, uh, when I held a seminar on the subject in Parliament, she said, well, why don't you set up a commission on it? So uh, we did. And if I have the next, uh, the next slide, um, out of that came this report, No More Blame Game. I got the go ahead from David Cameron to do it. And he was actually quite interested in social workers at that stage, not least because of his disabled child. He'd had his own social worker, so he was a bit more familiar than many other MPs who may never have come into contact with uh, social workers. Um, I got the go-ahead from David Willits, who was then the shadow sector state for education, who didn't really understand social workers and thought it would all be a bit counterintuitive. So are you sure you know what you're doing, Tim? But anyway, uh, he, let me, uh, he let me do it. If you go on to the next slide, I then put together uh, quite an interesting panel of, um, uh, of experts and a real mix of people. Alan Bowman, who'd been the chair of the Social Care Institute for uh, Excellence. Terry Butler, uh, a really uh, highly respected former DCS uh, in um, Hampshire. Felicity Collier, the, I mentioned earlier, the chief executive of, uh, of BAF. Uh, Ash Chand, who was a lecturer at Warwick University in social work. Mark Houston, who'd been a chair, uh, who actually still works in the Home Office, who'd been a child in care, who was then working for Hampshire uh, Council. Uh, a couple of uh, psychologists, Melanie Gill and uh, Caroline um, Steen, uh, Trish Morris uh, in the Lords, who's involved with various disability charities, Polly Neat from the National Children's Homes, who's now gone on to Women's Aid and now is at Shelter, and then some practitioners such as Alistair Pettigrew, who's the DCS at, uh, at Lewisham, Sharon Ritchie, a cabinet uh, uh, member, and Professor June Thoburn, who is still Professor Emeritus now at uh, University of East Anglia. A really interesting heavyweight mixed panel of academics, practitioners, uh, service users and, uh, and others, many of whom were die in the wool Labour supporters and Labour members, but were all prepared to come together uh, because they were frustrated with what was going on in, in government and wanted to produce some alternative visions and put pressure on the government to, to change um, things. So we had a really good basis for coming up with uh, some really good recommendations. We spent a year interviewing a huge amount of, uh, of, of people, uh, visiting all sorts of uh, projects, uh, having uh, uh, international calls to the chief social worker of New Zealand, from which came the idea for a chief social worker in the UK, which has come to uh, fruition, although one might have some criticism of the incumbent of that, uh, of that role, but it's, I think, a very necessary uh, role. Um, and we produced this uh, report, if we can go on to the next uh, slide. And the recommendations, uh, we came up with 14 uh, recommendations, uh, and I'm not going to repeat everything uh, here, but it was about working with families in a preventative role. Hey, how radical is, uh, uh, is that? Um, having the role of a consultant social worker, there was a problem with you had good social workers on the front line, the only way they got promoted was to put them behind a desk and what a waste of those talents it was. So some of the sort of social work teams that we saw in practice in, in Hackney and the role of consultant social worker that gave people some management uh, uh, responsibilities, but also kept them as practitioners uh, on the front line as, uh, as, as well. Uh, we wanted to big up the professional body. There should be a body looking after social workers that has the same sort of status as the BMA or RCN. That turned out to be rather problematic, but the rest of that is uh, history. The recommendation about a chief uh, social worker and then some recommendations around uh, training and uh, the degree and post-qualifying uh, CPD uh, and also a recruitment campaign. We looked at ways of how we could, uh, we encouraged um, some TV channels, why didn't they have a soap along the lines of casualty of Holby City, which dealt with social workers? So actually people could see them as doing a really challenging job and actually let people into, social workers into their living rooms so people could understand it. And this 
terribly malign image that social workers have with so many people could be countered at, uh, at last. So we came up with, um, I think, some really interesting, meaty recommendations. And this was from a conservative opposition uh, who conservative members of parliament and social workers often were not put together, frankly, in the same sentence. And I remember there was a great quote in the media when we produced this report, which said, never mind about hugging hoodies, if they're hugging social workers, the Conservative Party really are thinking the unthinkable. Well, I took that as a, uh, a badge of uh, honour, along with a letter I had from Paul Dacre, where we invited the editors of the major newspapers to come and uh, appear in front of our uh, Commission on Social Work to give their view of social workers and why they had such a bad press. Paul Dacre, and I was looking for the letter, wrote me back a fantastic letter, accused me of being a sandal-wearing dodgy lefty, um, and why was I wasting time as a Conservative P dealing with all this stuff, which absolutely epitomised the problem. Um, and I, I wanted to publish that letter as part of the report, but in the end, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't allow me to, uh, uh, to do it. But that was a challenge we were up, uh, up against. The establishment media had it in for, uh, for social workers. So that was the basis for then what became policy and some more work that we did. If we very quickly just whiz through um, the next slide, we then produced in um, uh, uh, 2009 um, a more comprehensive version of recommendations in response to the Laming inquiry, which was Herbert Laming looking being brought back out of retirement to look into the Peter Connolly um, affair. So we made a number of recommendations uh, as part of um, uh, that uh, report. Uh, we then produced, we go on to the um, next slide. Uh, we also produced um, uh, this document, which not many people seem to be aware of, but it was effectively a manifesto for child um, protection. It was called Child Protection Back to the Frontline, produced just before the election in 2010, where it crystallized some firm commitments that we made. Uh, and if we go on to the next slide, so that, that frontline phrase, which got nicked, was our phrase to start with, and then became obviously Josh McAllister's um, uh, organization. Um, and the proposals we came up there, again, not, nothing that was rocket science, but some key things um, about recruiting high-grade um, uh, graduates, about whether we should have social worker practices like GPs, the, the chief social worker uh, uh, appointment, as I've mentioned, and then publishing serious case reviews. This became quite controversial, and I was surprised. I had not realized that serious case reviews were never actually published. So we made a manifesto commitment that we would publish all of them going forward, and four key ones retrospectively, uh, including uh, Baby um, Peter, which we subsequently um, published, um, and uh, that we would abolish contact point as well, which was one of the first things that I did when I then became uh, children's minister. Next slide. A thing which um, uh, Carl isn't mentioned in your book, we also did a very big review of adoption at the same time, and which we published in 2010. So there was a huge amount of work going on within the Conservative Party in opposition on children's social care and policy. And of course, we embarked on a big reform programme for um, uh, adoption, uh, alas, much of which has now gone backwards. So we had the election. Uh, in May 2010, eventually the coalition government was, uh, uh, was, was formed. And one person I had come across on the subject of contact point, which was the Labour government's big computer system, which supposedly had details of every child in the country, somebody who lobbied me heavily about how this was a huge infringement on the liberty of our, our children and really dangerous was one Professor Eileen Munro from um, uh, from LSE uh, and her partners in uh, in crime, uh, and was one reason why we took against Contact Point and we we opposed the uh, the legislation there. So I then asked Eileen if she would be prepared to come and head a review into safeguarding and the role of child safeguarding uh, social workers to try and then turn into uh, policy points much of this work that we had been doing over previous years. Uh, right from um, no more blame uh, game. And I'm uh, delighted that she agreed to uh, uh, to do that. We commissioned um, Eileen to start that report in June 2010. If you remember, the election was in May. 
it was the first report review which was commissioned within the DfE, all the stuff going on about schools. It was actually a children's social care report that was the first piece of work to be commissioned within the, uh, the DfE. And a year later, if we can go on to the next slide, um, Eileen produced her uh, excellent report, which I think um, most people agreed was a really serious bit of work. And importantly, it was done in peacetime as it were, it wasn't done as a knee-jerk reaction to a Victoria Columbia or a Baby P type incident. And I think it benefited from having people's sort of cool and balanced responses to an underlying uh, problem of what was wrong with the uh, with the system. Now, many of those recommendations, uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, and Eileen will now no doubt go into them, um, Munro lays down the law, that famous uh, front page of community uh, care with a very stern looking, uh, looking Eileen um, there. But it was, people really took notice of that report. Many of the recommendations I was able to, uh, to take up and, um, and, and put into, uh, into practice. Um, but the one that was really, really important and that I never succeeded getting through in my time was a statutory duty on early help. And surprise, surprise, that forms the basis of the case for change in the McAllister uh, report. It should be all about preventing, prevention and early intervention rather than uh, on crisis uh, management and, uh, and late scale intervention. And that's also behind the recent Leadsom report, which I think is a really important piece of work that I've been very involved with uh, uh, about a better start in life for really ch young children as well, which is significant in that the government have now adopted as policy something which is absolutely about early intervention uh, and prevention rather than responding to the, uh, the symptoms. So the final two principles, which I think we um, adopted, and my response to Eileen's review and what we were trying to do, is I, as I described it, I want to give social workers the confidence to get it wrong. Uh, I don't want them to get it wrong all the time, but I want them to use their professional judgment uh, and not just look up in the rule book what they uh, were supposed to do, but I wanted them to have the confidence of making a value judgment based on their experience, on their professional capabilities, and occasionally they will get it wrong. But I'd much rather they, they came to the right decision uh, by using that than rather than just going by the rule book, which wouldn't necessarily produce the best outcomes for those children. And the final point, and Eileen, I'm sure we'll go into this in more detail, is we, we far too often just looked at the symptoms, the sort of historic, the chronology of what went wrong in a baby P case or a Victoria Columbia case or a Daniel Peltzer case or whatever it may be. The details of it are actually largely uh, irrelevant. What's really important is how on earth did the system allow that to happen? How did it allow professionals to make those judgments or fail to make those judgments or make wrong judgments or, or whatever it may, uh, uh, may be? So it was all about attacking the underlying problems with the system rather than the symptoms of those problems when they uh, when they actually uh, emerge later on. So I think that that piece of work, which I'm really proud of, that we commissioned Eileen to do in the first place, I think is as relevant today as it ever was. And if my successors and the, uh, uh, the powers that be had allowed more of Eileen's report to be translated into real practical action at the coalface, uh, I think Josh McAllister's uh, report, the final slide, may not have been necessary and certainly wouldn't be flagging up some of those familiar problems, which I was talking about in boring speeches 20 years ago, and I'm afraid are still at the heart of the challenges facing social workers and vulnerable families. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. And you'll be pleased to hear there's a historian colleague on the, on the chat who's interested in your your speeches and asking can you archive them in a, in a <laughs> library um, gosh <laughs> um, so, so just before i pass on to andrea i've got a, a question from one of one of the lefty the committed lefties on your uh no more blame game uh, commission um professor june thoborn is asking if you <laughs> if you had a comment on the decision that was taken to have um two chief social workers rather than one which i think was the recommendation the initial, initial recommendation was to have one covering adult and children's social work. 
Uh, good to hear from you, um, June. And June was absolutely invaluable and uh, certainly um, made clear her political views, um, which was fine, but we all worked for common cause. So yes, uh, we were of the view, and I shared that view, that we needed a chief social worker and that it should straddle children and, uh, and adults. Um, and that there were complementary disciplines that could be applied to, to both and learn from, uh, from each. For a combination of circumstances, which I won't go into detail publicly, um, that then didn't become possible. And then um, I was no longer children's minister. So actually, when the first uh, chief social workers were appointed, it was after my um, tenure. But I was very much of the view that we should have one chief uh, social worker and one of the advantages of that as well is that it would straddle the department for health and the department for education rather than those two departments operating in uh, in silos which is part of the uh, part of the problem that we uh, that, that we have so um it was beyond my pay grade to make that um uh, that decision but i was very much of the view as was the no more blame game panel that it should remain as a generic um uh, role Okay, thank you. There'll be more questions later on. <laughs> um, Andrew, can I can I hand over to you to talk us through the social work task force, please? Uh, yeah, and and thanks very much for inviting me uh, to to contribute. Uh, it caused me to do um, uh, quite a lot of thinking, um, dredge my memory. But uh, I mean, Tim was very complimentary about. Where my slides look, if he'd put his archaeologist hat on when he was looking at that, he would have realised all I did was dig them up. Um, these are original social work task force um, slides by and large, or I've used their master, so uh, nothing, nothing uh, reflects my technical capabilities there. Um, and when Tim flashed through all the uh, the, the history of guidance, uh, it made my stomach churn a bit because our work does seconded to. Uh, what was then DCSF, I worked on Every Child Matters, I was an advisor to the Children Act 2004, and, and so many of those other uh, reports you mentioned have my fingerprints on, and, uh, and uh, I've made a contribution to the uh, infantilization of social work, which I regret, by produce, helping produce all that guidance, um, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so can we move on to my first slide, please? Uh, Carl asked me when he contacted me to, to, to consider these three questions um, and um, fortunately I've not had to rely on my memory and, and, and um, the, there's enough sort of history in, in the cupboard on my wall to, to get me through it. And some of the slides I've used interestingly I, I, I used at the BASMA annual seminar in 2008 so again this is just a reflection of the time and, and bear in mind this was a government task force. We'd seen Tim's report, but that was an opposition report. So being mindful of it and thinking of the content was, was fine. Mentioning it was another matter entirely. Um, and and well, I'll, I'll deal with a couple of the issues uh, about what we, uh, what we saw in it and, and, and how we've responded to it as I, as I go through. Um, the, the suggestion has been made that um, the trigger for the task force was the death of Peter, Peter Connolly and, and Moira Gibb, who was chair, recalls a, a difficult uh, meeting she had with Ed Balls not long after his, what was clearly not his finest political moment when he sat the director of children's services from Haringey. Um, but, but actually, once we got into um, the work of the task force, um, if you move on to my next slide, um you'll see that the issues had been exercising um the both the departments of children's services uh children schools and families and and, uh, and and health for some time they had already established um a joint unit that was doing uh, background work and and this slide has at its top there what is effectively a joint ministerial statement um uh, two ministers, key ministers, are saying social workers are critical in a nation um, and, and we need to do better by them. Um, <clears throat> their um, review suggested that the profession 
both the profession and the settings in which social work was delivered worked against good quality practice, which then worked against good quality outcomes. So we were given a very wide brief um, to, to look at every aspect of social work. And, and I'll go into a bit more detail about a couple of the things uh, Tim's um, uh, mentioned already. But the, the, the issue was about both quality and capacity in, uh, in, in social work. Um, and it wasn't just about um, individual social work practice, although that's what tended to get all the headlines. Um, if you go to my next slide, please. Um, this is the reality of um, trying to work, um, you know, work with your caseload in um, a number of authorities. The analysis that was carried out by the by the joint unit, um, you can see uh, when comparing social work um, vacancy rates with um, other local uh, health or, or or local system children's system employees, the vacancy rates were just massive. You know that they were um, making it impossible to create and and de deliver work through a stable workforce. Um, and half of local authorities that had been then advertised were saying um, they were unable to appoint when they looked to appoint um, because they simply weren't getting sufficient high quality uh, candidates. And um, the, the little graph there um, shows the huge regional variation in, in vacancy rates as well. Um, at the time, I was, I was lucky enough to be working in, in Cheshire, um, very large authority, um, and um, it, we tended to employ pe people who live locally and we didn't have this problem. But, but in um, the uh, metropolitan areas and, and London, the problems were really significant. And uh, it, it, the profession was being delivered by people who were not being supported. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Tim mentioned um, the, uh, the 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 points issue. Um, yeah, there's a couple of a couple of dialogue boxes open up on this one as well. Sorry, I forgot to click them off. Um, uh, but when we looked at um, uh, a, a review of, of um, uh, the, the entrance to social work courses, th this is the, 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 the finding behind um, you know, Tim's headline. Um, clearly, to be a social worker, you need emotional uh, resilience, you need emotional intelligence, you need intellectual curiosity, you need intellectual agility, you need facility with language, both uh, oral and written, and um, what we looked at was a series of um, uh, processes which didn't seem to enable uh, so social work uh, courses to select sufficient people with that full range of, of um, skills and attributes. Um, this one just highlights the uh, sort of A-level scores. But um, uh, when we looked at recruitment generally onto courses, there was a whole series of other things behind it. Which, which meant um, people who were always going to struggle as social workers were entering the training to the profession and the, the attrition rate was quite high. And maybe that's not a bad thing. And we had a long debate in the task force about uh, whether if you enter the social work degree, it necessarily meant it was a failure if you didn't become a social worker. You know, it's a good, well-rounded degree, lots of content in it. So. So why not use it as a springboard to something else? But but actually, um, the 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 whole issue of, of of entrance into this degree level profession big, exercised us quite a lot. And can you move on to my next slide, please? Um, the other thing that came up in in the pre work to the task force um, was the idea that um, there are two more dialogue boxes. If you can click on those as well. Thanks. Um, if you look at that top box, 85% of newly qualified teachers felt they were equipped to do their job, and only a third in the bottom box of, of qualified social workers thought their social work course had prepared them. Now, we looked at that, and actually, rather than just fixing it so that um, everyone went straight from a social work course into 
um, feeling satisfied in their job, we asked a different question. We said, is it reasonable, given the complexity of social work, to go straight from a degree uh, into a fully functioning role, uh, into a role as a fully functioning social worker? Um, and we took this particular piece of, of evidence and, and dealt with it quite differently because we said we're a bit shocked if anyone can come out of a degree and become a fully functioning professional. There needs to be a lot more to competent, confident work than simply having a degree. Um, so we started building in um, a, a different approach on the basis of, uh, of what we'd found about people feeling that their social work education had helped them enough. Uh, to become practitioners. Um, next slide, please. Um, so coming back to that uh, fundamental question, um, what is it the task force, having you know, assembled a piece of uh, evidence there that uh, said things were not great, what was the government trying to achieve uh, through setting up the task force? Um, and they asked us quite clearly to talk to practitioners to get uh, beneath um, uh, the, the headlines in the sun and, and to start talking about how to create a profession that was self-sustaining, uh, to build in some short-term fixes, but a long-term reform program. Um, and the whole issue of public uh, confidence and esteem was important then, it's important now, and we haven't cracked it. Um, yeah, we, we did have the odd storyline in Coronation Street, but it, it wasn't what Tim was after. Um, it wasn't um, a, a normalising of social work as good practice um, in, in the media. Um, and of course, we had to take account of Herbert Laming's uh, most recent review. Um, and the government was alive to communications issues and gave us a, a challenge to come up with a communication strategy at the end of the process to uh, to, um, to to deliver the reform program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, just a little bit more detail. We had a joint unit. The civil servants that worked with us, there were many of them and they were superb. Many of them had been in, in, historically uh, working in uh, the field of social work education. Um, and um, uh, we uh, started out looking at those questions which have just recurred in, in Josh McAllister's report. How are social workers deploying their time? How well supported are they enabled to deliver a complex job? Um, what actions and behaviours um, um, make the most difference? What is it about practice that we should be supporting? Um, and how, how do we improve, you know, really drive improvements into frontline practice? That was, that was our, our big challenge. And um, I was asked to comment on the, the people who took part in the task force. So my next slide lists the core task force. Um, not so many of us, but um, Moira was um, approached, as was I, and Bob uh, Reitermeyer, Chief Executive of the Children's Society. Um, I've no idea how, why, what sort of procurement or selection processes went into it, but the three of us met uh, with a couple of senior civil servants, having agreed to take this on, and selected the, um, the, the, the task force that you see there. Um, and we made sure Baz was involved. We made sure um, Helga Pyle from uh, the, the lead on social care from Unison, the trade union was involved. Um, we had um, two, one adult, one child um, uh, representative of service users. We had employers represented through the LGA and through um, directors of children's and adult services and a core of half a dozen practitioners. Um, and because this is uh, alphabetical, uh, we had that year's um, uh, president of the Association of Professors of Social Work, Sue White. Um, so we, we selected that group and we were um, thinking through some of the issues around communications and, and publicity. And Moira wanted to bring in Deirdre Saunders, the problem page editor of The Sun. And as someone who lives in Liverpool, uh, anything to do with the sun was a complete no-no to me and to have the uh, um, problem page editor seemed like a bizarre um, uh, suggestion. But she'd worked with Deirdre, Maura had worked with Deirdre and 
found her to be very constructive and she turned out to be extremely helpful, extremely, uh, and, and one of the most constructive members of the task force. Um, she was a real asset in, in helping us see how things will play through um, once we got our reports and our recommendations out there. Um, and that caused a certain amount of controversy. Um, uh, and and uh, I think it was the right decision with hindsight. Next slide, please. Um, we produced one report quite quickly, within about three months. Um, I was asked to comment on how we worked. We had the core task force and we set up a call for evidence. We had um, uh, a number, of, at least a dozen of events for practitioners around the country. Um, the most northerly one I did was Sunderland. Uh, we went and spoke to, in in camera with um, representatives of uh, the government, um, the uh, professors of uh, social work education. We took part in conversations with uh, the university sector outside just social work to talk about how things could be uh, changed radically. We had a lot of conversations uh, and tried hard as we could to build relationships with as many uh, elements of, of, of uh, our communities. We then set up um, uh, two stakeholder groups, one for practitioners and one for service users. And everything we did had, I and mean, we were inundated with slide packs, but everything we did, we ran past as many sectors as we could, as we were working fast on a series of recommendations. Um, and the, the first themes that came, came through to us are, are just so familiar. Social workers don't have enough time to work with the people they want to work with. They're overstretched, they're tied up in bureaucracy. They haven't been given the tools they need to support them to do their jobs. That became a big theme for us. So it wasn't about social work, it was the setting in which social work's delivered. Um, we've been told new social workers aren't properly prepared. We've been told um, that there is no strong national voice, and I'll come onto that in a bit. We've told the systems for managed performance are, are unhelpful and that the so, social work profession is un, undervalued. They, they were our key themes. And um, so on, we started immediately on trying to do something about some of them. I led a group that uh, reviewed the, um, what, what Tim just referred to as the integrated children's system, the, uh, the, the, the system of case record keeping, which um, had been built in part, it, there were half a dozen versions of it, but it had been built to um, try and drive practice. And it was a recording tool that was supposed to drive practice. And it was really um, clunky, but it was fundamentally flawed in its thinking. Um, and um, I suppose our first success was I got all the uh, providers together in one room and they agreed to change it if the government would allow, uh, would change, the, would relax the, uh, the conditions. And, and it, it improved after that. Um, but that was a, a big sort of moral victory within the Department for Children, Schools and Families. Next slide, please. Um, this became known as the, um, the tombstone slide um, for obvious reasons. And what it did was just sum up for us that, and I won't go through the detail of it, but what we needed was a strong foundation and a long-term reform program. And there was no point in trying to tink tinker around the edges with social work. If the government, if we're going back to the, the joint ministerial statement of what the task force was for, then we needed a long-term reform program. And some of us were had been around long enough and been involved in enough life system change to know that this was not going to be a two-year job, it was going to be a five-year minimum job, because some of the culture change and some of the lead-in times for change, working against vested interests, were going to be so strong. So now I'll come on to look briefly at the um, uh, recommendations the, um, the, the task force made in its final report at the end of 2009. And on, there, there were 15 in total. And on this first page, the first uh, three, um, we produced um, uh, the practical tools to enable change to happen. Uh, 
the mission criteria were changed. It wasn't easy. There were some difficult conversations about how you measure capacity, how you measure intelligence in a, in a sensitive and sensible way, how you uh, measure the impact of cultural difference on attainment. So all that went into a, a, a complex debate about getting right entrance into social education and training. And, um, and, and we made some serious recommendations about the, the, the need for curriculum to be reformed and overseen by a single body. And interestingly, Frontline was launched with multi-millions of government money before it even had a curriculum, but um, I won't dwell on that. Um, then uh, we came into the issue of assessed year in employment, the creation. We recommended that, um, uh, we talked about license to practice a lot, and we recommended that um, uh, Social work, the social work qualification, regardless of the degree element of it, the social work qualification itself should only be awarded at the end of, of the first year in practice. Uh, we lost that one. Um, but, um, and that was partly because I think the, the nature of practice placements was so demanding that the idea that you then extend that into an employment year um, became a practical uh, non-starter, um, e even in the medium term. And something I think I, I, I regret we didn't uh, make more of. My next slide picks up the next five uh, recommendations. And here um, we were focusing on employers. Um, there was absolutely no point, and, and we had the LGA involved, local government association, but there is no, there was no single route to get to people who employ social workers in statutory roles. No way of holding them to account um, for um, their recruitment, uh, retention, supervision policies, and so on. And at the end of the task force, I was um, asked to write a piece for the local government chronicle aimed at chief executives of local authorities, um, which I just found in my notes the other day. And, and um, my challenge to them at the end of it was, was quite simple. So yeah, every chief executive in the local authority Go and find out what proportion of your council's budget is directly linked to social work decisions. It's about 65% generally. They didn't know that. And then ask yourself if you're doing enough to enable those social workers to make the right decisions. Um, I think there's a bunch of a post bag on that one for some reason. Um, but we really concentrated on the need to improve uh, frontline management and uh, as I say, supervision and, and the, to get the settings right uh, in which social work could thrive. Um, final slide um, on, uh, sorry, just on, on the recommendations. We advocated the creation of the National College of Social Work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and, and we saw that as the key to the sustainable development and delivery program that we were talking about, the sustainable reform program. An independent national college, we asked ourselves which professions manage their, themselves best and what have they got in common? And something to do with the idea of it, you know, the, the Royal Colleges, of the medical colleges or, or whatever, needed to be developed, but specifically the social work. We weren't too prescriptive, but we saw that as as the main engine room. And you'll know nowhere on in the task force to be recommend the um, creation of a chief social worker. We thought about it, thought about hard, and we didn't reject it just because it was Tim's idea. Um, and uh, it would have gone down badly. We wanted to put all our eggs in the basket of the college. Um, the sort of hero leadership of a, of a single person in the, in, in the central government department wasn't gonna be enough in our view to create that culture change, that leadership, that voice um, that a social work college could, could deliver. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we came up with the idea that we needed a reform program that spanned uh, probably up to 2020. Um, phase one, a transition into uh, the reform board. We published our, uh, our review. Uh, set up the reform board which was to run for a couple of years and then the, the College of Social Work and some of the other changes were to, to take over from it. 
Um, that was our plan. And uh, my final slide, I just looked very briefly at what happened uh, as a consequence of those uh, recommendations. Reform Board was set up. Uh, the government uh, chief social workers um, were established. Um, and that's a deliberate use of language. The government chief social workers were appointed. And I chaired a meeting in Manchester at a session where it was the first time they both shared a platform, not, uh, not long after their, their appointment. And what was clear was they were coming from such different places and such with such different agendas that both in terms of their host departments and themselves, um, that uh, what, whatever the vision was Tim had had, uh, had gone down the toilet. Um, uh, we saw some change in the regulatory role. It wasn't enough, really wasn't good enough. College of Social Work was established. It failed, partly because of government funding, um, but partly because when it was set up, and, and I can't go into a huge amount of detail this because I opted not to become part of it, but it didn't get off to the right start alongside some of the other stakeholders like Baswell. And Baswell were at the time were becoming a trade union and they were um, calling themselves the College of Social Work. There was a, a turf war going on and collectively we missed an opportunity to get together on that and resolve it. Uh, and that was part, partly why it, it failed. So those are some of the structural things that came into place some of the processes there's an asye um, approach now professional registration i'm still a registered social worker uh, and all i can say is um, it needs to be a bit tougher to get re-registered every year if i can do it um, we did reform ics but um and and we did reform the entry requirements to degree course and we got somewhere on the employer standards and the health check that we introduced and and to some extent uh, although I'm generally quite critical of the way Ofsted works, Ofsted's approach has solidified some of those uh, expectations of employers. But then there were some distractions. Um, the government commissioned, uh, before the ink was dry on the Reform Board's work, two new reports. Uh, well, they issued uh, Commission One from Martin Neri, and then the uh, Department of Health quickly caught up with the, the Croesdale Apple report on to, in, into social work education. Ofsted continued to drive practice down all the wrong roads. Um, and there were a lot of ongoing media attacks and, and not least, you know, going back to my point on behalf of the task force, we wanted to get the, the media image better. Um, the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, um, took every opportunity he could to attack social workers and social work as a profession. Uh, and undermine the work that's been put in place. Whereas Tim, um, very publicly, came and spent a week in my department, embedded with my social workers in Stockport. Um, he went out on an emergency duty team visit, and um, I think when I retired, was was still remembered for the aplomb with which he received the mouthful of abuse from a five-year-old who thought he was a social worker. Um, so that's me, my memories, and uh, and and the history um, in response to the brief I was given. So thanks very much. Um, thank you, Andrew. And there'll be there will be some more questions, but I think I should hand straight over to Eileen if you're if you're ready. Right. Well, my review certainly follows both in time, but also in a concept in, um, of the other two. I'll cover three things: how and why the report review was set up um, from my point of view, the process that I took in undertaking the review and then um, the um, what's happened since uh, briefly. So how and why it was set up was um, getting a phone call from Tim asking me if I would um, chair such a, yes it began as just chairing a committee um, but it somehow transmogrified into being the Monroe Review. Um, but he asked me this before the general election and I'd been highly critical of what was going on, so I thought it would be a bit cowardly not to uh, try and do something better, you know, instead of just being critical, but to say what solutions could be. Uh, and also, I thought the Conservatives probably wouldn't win the election, so I'd never be asked to do it anyway. But um, they eventually got in in a coalition. <laughs> so I had a bit of time to prepare, and I spent that actually talking to a number of my colleagues at the LSE to get some understanding of um, what's involved in doing a national review and how best to, to manage the process. 
um, and that was extremely um, helpful to me. So in terms of the process, the, the practical level was very guided by that. I had um, I'd been told I needed to keep the government aware that I was working, otherwise just turning up with a final report 10 months later, um, they'd have probably forgotten they'd commissioned the report. So I um, had weekly meetings with Tim Lawton and um, we decided not to have any civil servants in the room so that we could speak freely, but also because we had the fun of knowing we were making them anxious about what we were saying. Um, but I also agreed to do, well, I set out that I would write three reports and over the, it was a 10 months rather than a year. And I had a day taken off because uh, Prince William decided to get married on the day I was due to submit the report. So I had to do it a day early. But uh, the first report was to offer my analysis of the problems to the sector and invite their responses um, about whether the analysis seemed accurate. Um, and I got very, very strong responses back and um, a lot of uh, endorsement of what I was saying. Because I, I think it's, it's, um, it is disheartening um, that one can describe what's wrong with the social work uh, practice and again, I think uh, the latest Josh McAllister report is describing problems, but it's trying to dig deeper into how what's making people act in ways that none of them individually want to do, because you join social work to do the kind of engaged, uh, constructive work with families. Um, and uh, so it's puzzling that some things are stopping them from doing it. But my second report came out later, sketching the direction of travel of what kind of reforms I thought were going to um, make a difference to help shift the dynamics of the system. And in response to that, I got some really fantastic detailed responses. And one of my regrets about the whole um, review was that the time pressures and my limited energy level meant that I, I couldn't read all of them with as much attention as they deserved, because there were an awful lot of people in the sector who had been thinking long and hard about why there were problems and coming up with ideas on how things would improve. Um, I think in a, in a way one could almost have had a, a review that was just um, collating and um, you know, making some coherent account from all those points. But you know, there were an awful lot of good people in the sector who were, who were very much wanting to, uh, to drive change. And then my final report was setting out 15 recommendations and explaining the rationale behind them. So uh, in doing that work, the theoretical approach I took was based on previous work because as, as um, Tim and Andrew's accounts of their work, they, the kind of problems in the sector I had also been noticing having, I, I, it felt to me that, um, in a very uninformed way that it had been that social work had been strengthening its expertise during the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s and then somewhere around there it started to deteriorate as it became more and more proceduralized um, and it's difficult to believe now but um, there's an audit report dated to about 1992 which says uh, child protection social work was the most um, high status most desired job in social work and it was very difficult to get a job in it because people stayed so long and i can remember a time when adverts required three years post-qualifying experience before you could work with children and families and that made well it was the last century but it's you know it, it isn't the work it, the families haven't changed it's the work context that's changed and that's crucial to know it's not that this job has to be unbearable um so um, i had been as an academic um reading a lot trying to understand why things were going downhill when individually everything that was being done had some sense to it you know it wasn't as if silly plans were being made that it they were intelligent solutions to specific problems. And um, in all of my reading, I still am a bit baffled as to how this happened, but I, um, I came across engineering um, and um, I started reading engineering books and, and found that they um, also had problems. And, and that led me on to the whole aviation um, literature, which had a, a huge similarity to social work in that they had very rare, really horrible events like a plane crashing. And they too had been trying like social work to drive up the quality of the practice. Um, but um, somewhat earlier than social work, they had realized that their efforts to improve practice had got to the point of 
actually creating their own new problems and causing practice to deteriorate. And, um, and so they had adopted a systems approach. They had understood that instead of thinking that um, the pilot was to blame, you had to look at the context in which they were working. Um, and what they, what you, when you blame the pilot or you blame the social worker, the high level response to that is to tell them off so that they know they're meant to do the, you know, if, if a pilot is still alive after a crash, you, you tell him very firmly that he wasn't meant to fly into the mountain. Um, it does seem rather stupid in, in aviation, but equally stupid in social work. They, they enter the profession because they care about children and the well-being of children. They are not there to harm children. And so I don't think they ever need to be uh, chastised and told they really should try and help children in their work. Um, but the other thing that you do, which turned out to be so destructive, is that you try to make the practice better by giving them more rules um, to limit their choices. They can't make fallible judgments, then they have to do as they're told, which makes sense if it's about what size screw do you put onto this part of the plane. I mean, there's no problem with those sorts of rules um, when there's one right answer. But in social work, on the whole, we're making judgments. Um, there is no right way to speak to a child of six. You, you look at the child, you talk to them a bit, and you, you make your professional adjustment to their capacity and the situation and so on. Um, but along with increasing rules to try and control the workforce, because all the problems lie in the workforce, you believe, um, you have to then bring in more and more layers of, of um, inspection and compliance checking in order to make sure they're following the rules. And the more that you do that, the more that the rules start to control people and people start to... What happened in social work very much was that the Department for Education was producing um, a lot of very well-informed guidance, but because of the level of defensiveness and compliance in the system, people were interpreting it as absolute rules that you have to apply regardless of how inappropriate for a particular child or family or context. Um, so that kind of combination of thinking that rules can do more than they can um, and that there is one right way to do social work um, culminated in the kind of scenario I was seeing. So, yeah, blame, more, more um, control through rules and then more surveillance. Um, and what they had done instead in aviation was to start looking at the context. And that, therefore, was what my work before doing the review had started to do of, of examining how the ICS system, for instance, was having a ripple effect onto the um, the way that people worked. And um, the core problem in child protection work is that we are working with a very high level of uncertainty. And we don't quite know what's been happening in a family. We, to some extent, you know, you get families where there's nice clear evidence of, of harm. Um, but to some extent, we are making a judgment about that harm has happened and the severity of that harm and the causes of that harm. Um, but we're even more facing even more uncertainty about what might happen. Human violence can spiral very suddenly out of um, no apparent precursors. Um, and people can be violent and then not be violent again for the rest of their lives. It's, um, we have more uncertainty. Aviation has got some basic understanding of what takes a plane off the ground into the air and what keeps it up there um, than we do. And when you're dealing with uncertainty, um, in, in social work, we have then got caught up in the 19, into the 1980s and onwards. I, again, I think because you're a history network, probably a lot of the audience already know this, but the word risk does not appear in the social work literature before the 1970s. We talked only about things being unlikely or uncertain, or we, you know, a judgment would be, I think this is probably the most likely thing to happen. And, and along with the moving to the whole risk concept, you get this association with those areas of risk decision making where you have actually got good mathematics behind you. So in terms of tossing a, a dice, you've got six sides to a dice and you can say the probability of any side coming up. And we don't have that kind of knowledge um, in child protection work. So in many ways, we are, are aspiring to something that we can't actually manage. Um, but the when you look at risk management, uh, a decision is fallible and it's either, I mean, the dangers is that you have false positives or false negatives. 
And in social work, if you have a false positive, you leave a child with a family and the child becomes seriously harmed or injured, and then you get severe censure. If you do a false negative, um, then you have a child being um, not recognized to be in danger. And so, have I got it? I have to read this. I always get it the wrong way around. Um, false, yes, the false negative is the danger. That's where you leave the child at home thinking they're safe and they are in danger. And the false positive is when you take them into care for poor reasons. And that, when you have that kind of punishment for one kind of error and not for the other, then you will drive the system to avoid the false negative. And therefore, you, by mathematical implication, you increase the number of false positives. And I know that Isabel Trowler, the chief social worker, recently said in the Sunday Times that 50% of the child removals from families were wrong. And uh, she reminds me of the chief medical officer at Broadmoor, who I heard in a presentation many years ago saying that he was absolutely confident that 50% of the patients at Broadmoor were quite safe to be released. The problem was he didn't know which 50%. And I think, I think Isabel may well be right that 50% did not need to be removed, but who the hell knows which 50%? Um, and that's our problem. And until, I mean, one of the things I tried to, to get across in my review was that we, we are working with uncertainty and fallibility and nobody should claim to be able to manage risk in the sense of being able to eliminate it. We make it less likely that a child will be harmed. We don't get it right. We, and, and decisions have to be judged by whether they are well reasoned, not whether with hindsight it turned out the, the other way. Um, so I think that part of it, I think, um, has uh, uh, us actually in terms of what happened next, that seems to me one of the really crucial things um, that has happened to some extent, but not enough. Um, but the, in the terms of what's um, happened next, I think in terms of the handling uncertainty, one of the crucial points that I would make is that when social workers become highly defensive and take far too many children away, they are actually being quite rational in response to quite irrational criticisms. Um, and you've got, um, you know, we had a, a group on the media, and I know that this is something that the task force have been concerned about, of, of trying to get the media to stand back from making these hindsight um, errors at, at judgments and saying that, um, you know, when you read a story about any child death, the media only pick out the evidence that the child was suffering harm or was likely to suffer harm. They eliminate all the evidence about what uh, good parenting was going on and about, um, you know, all the positives in the situation. Um, and of course, they never distinguish whether the information was known to the social worker at the time or only known subsequent to the death. Um, so they always portray this picture that it was, the information was just set out in front of them so straightforwardly and uh, they failed to see it and, um, and they make them look idiots. And that's, uh, it is unfair. So um, I think the, um, you know, the, the, the safety route that the um, local authorities were taking was that given all this criticism, um, the more that they show that they're following the rules and they are completely compliant, the more they can escape from blame. Um, and that, and, and so to me, one of the, the very difficult things to shift is the confidence to make fallible judgments and the confidence to know that your senior managers will back you. Um, or somebody said uh, at a conference that he would uh, certainly stand behind his um, social worker if a death occurred and I suggested perhaps he should stand in front of her so that she didn't get the attacks herself. But uh, anyway, turning briefly to what has happened since, it's about um, they, all the recommendations were accepted. I mean, they, they were very, very coherent with the recommendations of the previous reviews. They were just more detailed, I think, in some respects. Um, but, you know, there was no conflict with between my recommendations and the task force as, at all. Um, and since then, um, they were all accepted about the early help one, which, you know, is, is really crucial because um, there's a lot of good reasons for taking a public health approach to child abuse and neglect. And, and that means that you try to put it in more services at an early level. So you make it easier for parents to do a good job so that fewer of them de develop um, serious problems later. 
uh, you know, and in the long term, it's the only strategy that can really work for the benefit of children, but possibly not for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, because um, poverty is a problem, and um, and it is it's just tougher to be a a, a good-tempered, sensitive, and available parent when you're worried sick about money. Um, so there's a nice political point for you, Tim. <laughs> um, but other than that, the um, the government came up with uh, innovation money, and um, I was asked by Andrew Turnell, who um, set up a developed a signs of safety practice approach, whether I would work with him in trying to implement it, and I. I said yes, because I, I am an academic, so I was curious to know what it felt like to be on the receiving end of my recommendations and to see whether they could actually work. And it has been a very illuminating experience. And, and the basic um, end point is that we worked with 10 local authorities and three of them can be said to have actually implemented signs of safety to a fair degree. And the remaining ones stumbled because um, they didn't make the organizational changes that actually enabled the frontline work to engage with the families in the um, very um, strength-based and um, approach of trying to work with the families in their networks rather than just rush in with a set of professional services. Um, and, and, you know, speculating about the differences between those authorities, I think one of the really crucial elements was the behavior of the directors and other senior managers. And when they fully understood how their behavior had a ripple effect down to what a child experienced, um, they, they became much more um, able to lead radical change. And they, they showed much more interest in practice. They did collaborative case audits. They attended group meetings. They, they held conferences where people showcased good practice. Um, and they gave um, the workers um, the confidence to make judgments and move away from the shelter of rules and to have the confidence that this was supported. And they also realized that if you want to give people more creativity at the front line, you also have to have more layers of oversight and support in, in a professional sense of having supervisors who've got the time to discuss through cases. And, in, in many of our, the local authorities we worked with who did really well, it was presented, creating a whole new tranche of people who were called either practice leads or practice um, champions, but they were available as an extra layer of casework support and teaching and training, realizing that basic training covers about 10% of the task and the ongoing reflection as you work gives you the real deepening of your skill. So I think that, that we have some, it's not just with signs of safety, some of the other innovations projects really um, did develop some very good practice that you could actually tolerate if a member of your family had to receive a child protection service, which is, I think, the best compliment you can pay to a service. And um, but they just it hasn't taken off. I hope that we get a, a ground, you know, a, a few pioneers who show that it could be done and it would blossom. Um, and of course, they've had to cope with massive funding cuts, which hasn't helped. But I, I it. Um, I have a feeling, you know, it seems to me there are examples of doing it well and building on those is a good line of future development, but it, 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 is, um, it hasn't progressed as extensively as I had hoped. So I'll stop there so that you can deal with some questions. Thank you very much, Arlene. That was some great, uh, some very complimentary comments on, on the thread. I think people very much enjoyed all of the presentations. Um, just trying to, I mean, you, um, all talked a little bit about um, early help or family help, as it's called, in uh, the, the case for change report out last week. Um, and somebody on the on the on the chat has commented that uh, apparently that the ADS ADCS commented recently that there is no legislated legislated requirement for uh, local authority children's services to provide preventative services. Um, I immediately think about the, the Children Act 1989 and Section 17, which I see as, as a key part of the legislative framework. Um, I just wondered uh, if I could start with you, Arlene, if you, why, why you thought it was important to, to try and have the, the early help duty uh, in place. I know that wasn't implemented and, and, and well, why it, you think it's- it, it's um, um, You know, local authorities work with limited funding and they have to make decisions about what to fund 
And in that competition, the statutory duties will always win out. So you won't get the investment in early help unless they have to do it, basically. Um, and um, because it's, you know, with all the early um, preventative measures, uh, there's always the political problem of, of demonstrating that spending now will be beneficial in the future. Quite often, the future is so far away, it's possibly under a different political party, so they won't gain any kudos from it. Um, but it is um, it is a problem that you know the, the it makes sense for a, a director of children's services to to put the bulk of the money into child protection because that's the one they get punished for most if they don't do it. Um, and um, so yeah, I think that it has to it has to be on a legally equal footing to section seventeen and and forty seven. Emma or Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'm, I'm not sure quite where the ADCS was coming from. It's, it's more complex, as, as, as Eileen suggests. That there is a requirement under Children Act 89 uh, to uh, have services which prevent the need for a, a child to become a, a, a child at risk of uh, harm. But there's, there's no quantification of that. So you know you 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 could you can demonstrate that you're meeting the minimum requirements of the law by doing almost bugger all. Um, if if you have um, um, an assessment service, it doesn't mean you also then have to have uh, a service delivery. Um, and I think we've partly as a result of the <clears throat> the way we've locked too much money into child protection and looked after children's systems, which don't give good value. Um, uh, we've we've prevented people from uh, providing services which start from the premise of how can I help this family? Now, if if you know you're going to be judged by um, uh, your internal criteria of audit or Ofsted or whatever it might be, uh, uh, in, in regard of have you applied a threshold um, uh, of harm and and done a second board seven inquiry with all the wills and uh, bells and, and whistles that that, that are entailed. If you know you're going to be judged on, on on that criterion, then you're going to do that instead of simply standing back and saying, you know what, I think I'll try and work out what this family needs. They don't perhaps need an assessment. They might need a bit of help. Tim, do you have anything That's to say? I, I think the, the problem is that there isn't really a statutory um, duty. And what there is there is couched in terms of, I think the phrase is, take reasonable steps. Well, as Andrew says, that can be interpreted in... Uh, uh, in, in whatever way you, you like. So what we tried to get is, you this is a two-stage process, you would need to have proper statutory duties that make it quite clear uh, that there need to be specific um, uh, outcomes. And then you need a way of, of scrutinizing uh, and measuring those, those outcomes. And I found this out through the reforms we did for adoption. So we were desperately trying to sort of change procedures and guidance on uh, on adoption, just as we did with fostering to a large extent. And I then suddenly realized that just writing a letter to every director of children's services, advising them about new guidance and uh, regulations, uh, did not automatically mean that that then happened. Um, and on adoption, I came across quite a few DCSs who were in complete denial about the extent of the problem, saying, oh, no, we've got a really good adoption department. I'm told that they are, uh, it's all going fine. Um, and then to give them their due, they did come back, some of them, later to say, actually, you're right, there is a problem with why adoption is not working better. So we came up with the adoption scorecards uh, approach, which alas has all gone by the wayside, but it was absolutely about laying bare the, uh, the implementation and outcomes that local authority uh, children's services departments were were achieving and it wasn't just on on bare numbers you know the problem was not how many kids were being adopted it was particularly the more problematic and challenging kids were just being left behind in the system for for far too uh, too long so you needed a transparent way of showing that certain local authorities appear to be doing really well and other authorities were not and why was that and then putting a spotlight on them to to, to find out uh, why they didn't appear to be uh, going with the with the legislation, so it's it's fine having legislation, but you've got to be have a have a way properly of scrutinising it. I, I don't mean Ofsted inspections; I, there are other better ways of doing it. 
And if I can ask a follow up question on early help, if I may. Um, how important do you think it is that um, social work professionals, qualified social workers, play a, a prominent role in, in, in the, the uh, assessment and delivery of early help services that is not done by other groups elsewhere, that they're central to that? Um, okay, from, from my point of view, I, and, and this applies in, in all sorts of areas, um, such as you know, managing flows through A&E departments, you put your most comprehensively skilled and experienced people in front of your organisation to, to do the filtering and um, assessment of, of uh, what is going to be the best solution to uh, the, the problem you're being presented with. So I would say it's absolutely essential, but that they have a whole range of services um, uh, available, uh, which they both contribute to and can refer on to. Um, uh, which offer practical support, but it, it's core. I, I think it's essential. I, in fact, I learnt when I went to spend the week with uh, with Andrew's department up in Stockport, the very first case I was taken to, and I think they deliberately took me to the scruffiest house in the scruffiest part of Stockport with the most challenging cases, which was fantastic because, you know, that's what I wanted to to see with a really, really good social worker. And here you had, there was a there was a mum who had uh, four young sons from three different fathers, none of whom were on the scene, living in a real state of, uh, of, of squalor. Literally, they were eating off the, off the floor. There was nothing in the fridge, blah, 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 blah. And um, we heard all about various different professionals all going in and out of that, that house all the time, but nothing was happening. And what it needed was that social worker having the power and the authority to be able to marshal all those uh, services and you know make sure that that mum absolutely took advantage of those uh, those services and somebody was on her case which is to an extent what the troubled families program was about where i think it was successful in that you do have that holistic approach but you have a key lead person who could well be a social worker in this uh, in this case who is attached with glue to that family and is absolutely making sure they get with the get with the program and that program is 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 available and there and doing the stuff it needs to Can I say, make a comment? Yeah. Um, I, I agree about the um, the role of the social worker at the assessment level, I, but I think um, it's important for that assessment to be done with a view of how can we help. You are alert to possibly seeing some evidence of serious harm, but you're not doing an investigation. You're not in that mindset. You're in the, I'm here to help. And I'm I'm seeking to to help to motivate you and to give you the confidence to to think you can improve, but but you have to also be scanning the situation for possible indications. Um, but you know you need to forefront the support dimension, but the other part has to be there in your mind. Um, and I think yeah. you, it's it's far too easy to. to fo yeah. Given that we our reputation is such that the family will feel fairly defensive when you arrive I think you have to go to quite ex you have to be quite explicit in your efforts to show that you're not there as a police officer yeah thank you okay I'll just change tack slightly um some comments on the um the chat and you've all mentioned about how we talk about social workers in the media and I think mm -hmm. also in political circles um in, in my mind we, we you know certainly you had last week talk social workers being criticised for for being overbearing and perhaps uh, not being supportive enough but maybe kind of thinking back to when Michael Gove was, was, was talking in 2012 we had the opposite we had we had social workers being criticised for for not being decisive enough and, and, and of course the truth is that social work is complex and that we need a uh you know a, a more sophisticated message i just wondered if you had any thoughts on how we can how we can get there because it always feels like you know, it's a bit like hokey cokey uh, you you're, you're in or out it's, uh, how, how how do we get that more how do we get more positive stories about social workers out there which is something both no more blame game and the social work task force talked about but we don't ever seem to make enough progress on i don't think well, we, I also covered it in my review, and, um, and since then I have actually had 
uh, I've had conversations with various people in the media um, uh, and, and tried to persuade them to consider running a positive TV documentary or a positive article about good practice. You know, they contact me about a case that's in the where there are problems. And, and I, I sort of say you could also go and look at a case which is giving really effective help to a family. But even when I get a junior person to think that might be interesting, their manager always overrides it as the, um, the public aren't interested in that. But it has actually happened a couple of times. Um, I mean, there was uh, Coventry, I think, very bravely opened itself up and they did a, uh, a several part documentary following social workers um, around, which I thought was really good. And it, and it showed them warts and all, but it showed them just how challenging that, that was. Trouble is, it was a bit of a sort of hard hitting documentary that rather than a, a coronation type thing that people might be able to identify and and more people watch that we that we needed to watch which is why you know literally we said can't we have some sort of soap you mm. know you have you, you have soaps with all sorts of professions in um uh now everything to sort of you know um forensic uh, pathologists and everything uh, everything else um i, I do the, the no more blame game my biggest regret on no more blame game is that no more blame um mindset didn't much outlast my tenure at the uh, at the DFE and um, well Michael Gove um, wedded at the hit with Dominic Cummings was always a challenge in my time at, um, at the DFE and his attitude towards uh, social workers and, uh, and others and then disappointingly David Cameron I mean, not long after I went then and the latest uh, horror that came along and David Can Cameron started sort of pointing the finger at, uh, at social workers as, um, as as well which was really disappointing but I do think part of part of the thing that went wrong is, uh, and Andrew queried this, our thinking behind having a chief of social worker was to be the face of the social work profession on the news in the same way as, you know, the chief medical officer when there's some big health crisis um, is there as a, a convincing professional credible face to reassure the, uh, the public and explain what's going on in much the same way as you know, professors Witty and Valance and others are doing that job at the uh, at, at the moment, although uh, slightly too uh, scaremongery at, uh, at at times. But actually, I think the public have now related to those to those two and think, you know, that uh, that's reassuring what we're hearing. We need to take that seriously. Alas, our chief social worker, certainly on the children's side, um, has hidden from the uh, uh, from the cameras needs to be in front of the cameras and needs to be that conduit between the profession and the department for education and and ministers rather than another civil servant reporting to the the appropriate minister and i think that's just been a huge missed opportunity i think the adult social worker she's done a better uh, job of uh, of being the face of adult social work although i think it could have been much more high profile but that was the intent behind the, the the chief social worker and i fear it just hasn't become a reality alas yeah and just just to come back on a couple of things there i, I, I always supported that ambition in relation to the um chief social worker but from my point of view having given it a lot of thought i just thought we'd get more traction with in in terms of um the profession itself um if if we had a really good strong college and it was a do we, do we dilute one with the other um well, i suppose was partly my debate and and then i, I think in reality i think things became very different but in terms of documentaries um when i was president of adcs i got um uh, roger grafe the uh, documentary filmmaker along to talk to our committee um about how to open up i had um three separate documentaries made um using you know real real life um uh, adoption work family intervention in courts and um uh, young mums uh, over my time as a, as a director and they're all really sympathetic well-made documentaries but not many people watch them i mean that's that I mean, that's why i think you know eileen's point it needs to go out of that uh, eight o'clock on Thursday, Channel Four slot, and go somewhere else because it doesn't matter how sympathetic and how instructive uh, those programs are. Um, you don't get them in front of the right people if you want to change attitude. Mm. 
I think okay. I think that's right. And if you, if you look at my other interest in archaeology, just look how many archaeology programs there are, and how people are taking interest in you know something mm. obscure as digging holes in the ground and uh, digging out old sheds of uh, of pottery. I mean, virtually every channel has got almost um, you know a a, a soap like. Uh, uh, program on uh, on archaeology or the, bringing the big dig to your garden or or whatever you know it can be done yeah, yeah. um i was thinking i i like the um detective stories <clears throat> on, you know where you've got a murder and you find out who did it and, and it seems you could have something similar for social work up to a point in terms of actually getting an understanding of what's gone on and who did what it's just that there isn't the decisive outcome there is you know, going back 10 years later, these children are now flourishing, um, which doesn't fit the storyline very well. Um, but I think, you know, in many ways, the, the early stages of a social work um, inquiry and building uh, relationships with a family could actually make very good drama. It's just that the timeline is, is wrong for a 30 minute programme. Thank you. I'm going to just, I'm conscious that We've all been here for quite a while now. Here's one more question, if I may. I'm, I'm quite interested in, in, in multi-agency working and multi-agency working for safeguarding. Um, and I know this is the Social Work History Network, but I just wondered if I could ask whether you think policymakers and politicians involved in this area pay enough attention to the contribution that other professionals, schools, health professionals, etc., uh, need to make to, to make to, to support families better, better protect children and, and, and to help social workers? Well, I think schools and health do a massive amount of early help already, don't they, in, in the nature of their work. And um, to varying degrees, schools, I think, are superb. During the pandemic, I've done some study of four local authorities, and there, there are lovely examples of teachers and social workers and health visitors cooperating um, you know, if one does a visit, the others tell the other about what they saw and how things are going and, um, you know, making it possible that they, they are major players. Um, and the and at the early help stage in particular, I think they they would play a, an enormous role or should play an enormous role. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree entirely. Uh, and, and I think if you look at some of the programmes that were picked up um, as a consequence of the government's innovation uh, funding, um, and, and the current investment in um, school-based social workers. Um, you know, in, in my authority, one of the first things we did in, before we bid for innovation money was, was create an, an integrated structure of social workers and health visitors. So I think there's a plenty of acknowledgement, um, but then you've got things which drive you in the wrong direction. Um, if you look at any Ofsted report into um, a, a, a local system, they ask and then answer the question, how well does this uh, authority understand thresholds? So they're actually judging you on how well you set up a system to hand off a child from one person to another. So un fundamentally undermining with the core, core judgment, uh, the idea about holistic approaches, joint working, um, and you know, going, going back to Eileen's points about um, uncertainty and, and sharing risk and you know a, a really clear role of social workers working with schools is to enable uh, say a primary school teacher to manage complexity in an area they're not familiar with um, and that's what they want to do often you know, they don't want to hand off to somebody else they, they they want to see a child thrive and I think we we still haven't quite got far enough in embedding that in everybody's thinking and, and when things go wrong uh, we don't ask how how good was the multi-agency working? We go straight into silos. Did the social worker follow procedure? Did the teacher follow procedure? Did the health officer follow procedure? And, and alas, that's borne out by serious case reviews and reports still coming out now, where inevitably it, it refers to lack of communication between uh, various agencies as uh, as well, and nobody picking up the, the, the ball of responsibility. But I, I think just as, um, uh, inter joined up government is a, an exceedingly elusive and non existent uh, phrase and non existent in practice, as I very soon found out. Multi agency working at uh, a local level is also very, uh, very challenging. Um, and if you look at the um, local safeguarding boards, there was always criticism there that it was really difficult to get health to the uh, to the table, and they were always rather reluctant uh, partner, or it was always somebody who wasn't really 
um, engaging. I and mean, I think the, the mashes were a good effort to, to uh, bringing uh, various disciplines together. Some of them worked uh, uh, really well, but it was again, it was mostly at the, the extreme intervention arm, whereas you needed them to be working much better at a prevention, early intervention role. And mm -hmm. I think, interestingly, the work that's going with the Leadsom review now, absolutely at the heart of that. And one thing that Andrea Leadsom has achieved, which none of us really achieved before, is bringing together, in her case, I think it was about seven different departments with seven different ministers, uh, and trying to join up an approach to apply to, in this case, kids from conception to uh, to age two. And if, if that becomes reality, it's now government uh, policy, that will be a really important move to how you can get departments and different disciplines working uh, together with somebody taking an overall view who has the power to intervene on the health department, the education department, the local government department to say, come on, you're not pulling your, uh, your weight and everybody has a responsibility to act in, in partnership on, um, uh, on, on that. But it's always been really elusive. I think as we put, I think in no more blame game, key to it is multi-agency training that if you've actually got a teacher sitting alongside a social worker, sitting alongside a police officer, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all being taught from the same training uh, manual with the same approach, you will then have a much better practical understanding. So when a case does come up, then those people will be speaking the same language and they will have had that network of, uh, okay, how do we jointly work together to, to solve this, uh, this problem? And we need to focus much more on multi-agency training. Yeah, and it, it, this is a theme in, in the, re the report that was out last week, definitely. Okay. It's nothing new, it's not rocket science. No, it's not new, and no, 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 it's, yeah. Yes, one, one of okay. the things I recommended was that anyone um, concerned about the safety of, and well-being of a child should be able to contact Children's Social Care and have a conversation with somebody, rather than having to fill in a referral form, because it seemed to me they should be able to access the social work wisdom um, well at the stage where they were wondering is this a problem or not you know that because it's um, you, it, you only fill in the referral form when you're more confident that you're dealing with a problem and I, I think that um, that uh, a lot of times those conversations can then lead to the to the teacher or the health visitor feeling competent to continue um, being the, the involved professional anyway um, but, you know it, it's that a conversations also just the best way that humans communicate, filling in forms and emailing it is less less effective. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I think um, I'm starting to get hotter and hotter sitting here in the small room. Thank you very much uh, to everybody who's attended. Um, and special thank you to Tim, Andrew and Eileen. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed it. Um, yeah. And I hope people here will uh, Look out for future Social Work History Network events. We have a, an event on the 24th of October, I believe, which is asking the question, what has happened to adult social work or social work with adults? Uh, details can be found on the, I think, on the Social Work History Network website it's on the Twitter handle, which, can we put the last slide up, please? coming up yeah so if you can check check the website or the the, the, the social work history network uh twitter address for future events thank you very much